Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to the uh, New England Mental Health uh, Technology uh, Transfer Center Network uh, webinar on connection and support. Peers helping others when life gets tough. We're happy to have you here today. This is second in a, a series of three webinars on uh, peer approaches and models uh, that address uh, issues of crisis. Um, our next one is on April 15th. Uh, there are details uh, about that later in the presentation. Today, we're very happy to be joined by Sarah Davidow, who's the director of the Wildflower Alliance and Oryx Cohen, Chief Operating uh, Officer at uh, the New England Empowerment Center. I'm sorry, the National Empowerment Center. I just made up a new name. Uh, this disclaimer, I'll summarize it for you. It just says SAMHSA or the Department of Health and Human Services are not uh, responsible for the content. Um, the MHTTC network is a network across the United States. And uh, you know they are affirming that they use respectful and recovery-oriented language in all activities. Um, certainly our presenters live and breathe these values, uh, but you can read them here that, you know, certainly that our values need to be consistent with our actions, um, our policies, our products, everything that we uh, put into our work. Um, and just some general housekeeping information. Your microphones will be muted throughout uh, this webinar. We do invite you though to ask questions, comments in the chat box. To get to the chat box, most of you just uh, hover on the bottom of your screen. Sometimes you need to hover over more and you'll see chat. Uh, you can chat to the whole group or you can send individual messages to different participants. So it's up to you. Have fun with that. We will take questions at the end of the webinar. So Oryx will present first and then we'll have Sarah and then we'll have uh, questions, comments. I'll kind of gather them as we go. If you have any questions or complaints after this webinar, you can email the New England uh, MHTTC network uh, and they'll be happy to address your concerns. And I do want you to know that this is recorded. There's also going to be a transcript that will be fixed up. The recording, um, is available about 24 hours after this webinar. Uh, transcript needs to be cleaned up so it takes a little bit longer uh, to get that neatly given. A uh, couple upcoming events, you can see them here. I won't read them, I just wanna highlight that again on April 15th, the third in this series of integrating peer support. Um, Enhancing Crisis Services with Lived Experience. So that webinar will present more details on intentional peer support and talk about the operation of a warm line within a crisis service system. Um, and that's all for me. I'm very excited to introduce um, uh, Oryx Cohen and um, happy to have Oryx with us here today. So Oryx, go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you, Cheryl and the MHTTC for having me on this webinar. Um, welcome to all of you who took the time to come today and I'm very happy to be presenting with um, Sarah as well. So as Cheryl said, I work with the National Empowerment Center and we are a peer run national organization in mental health. Um, and um, so, uh, yeah, so we're, we're, all, we're peer run. And um, one of the reasons that Cheryl invited me is because we do offer technical assistance um, in regards to peer respites. So I'm gonna be focusing on uh, peer respites today, and then um, Sarah's going to be talking about alternatives to suicide. Um, I did want to also let you know, because it is related, that um, I moonlight as a film producer, and um, 
And we made a film called Healing Voices and actually uh, there's a scene in the film that takes place at the Afia, Afia Peer Respite, which Sarah's organization operates. Um, so again, the film is Healing Voices and it's actually now on Amazon Prime. I'll, I'll, I'll shoot out a link to you after I'm done presenting. Um, and you can actually see some of my experience there at the, at the peer respite in the film. Um, so I'm gonna use that lens of, um, I'm actually someone who's been in a peer respite and had um, a really good experience. So I am going to be talking about peer respites. Here is a picture of, of a peer respite. Um, as I was saying, uh, I, I don't remember exactly where this peer respite was, is located, I believe in Wisconsin. And I think that says a lot about peer respites is they're really um, designed to be a house in a neighborhood, in, in a community, not really meant to stand out in, in any way. Um, so this is an example of uh, what, one, what one peer respite looks like. So what are peer respites? Um, well, they're short-term overnight programs or, or overnight homes, really, um, that allow folks to have a respite for whatever situation that they're um, going through. Uh, so it's, it's meant to be short term, usually three to 10 days. Um, some, some places have more flexibility than others around how, how long the stays are at the respite. Um, and currently there are uh, over 30 peer respites across the country. We actually have a listing of all the ones that we know about um, on our website. Um, but I know there's new ones being uh, organized all the time. And that's something that we uh, help with at, at our organization, uh, supporting folks to organize new peer respites. So these are staffed by peers. And um, we can struggle with the language of how we describe ourselves. Um, but uh, you get the idea that we have, that is staffed by folks that have similar experience. And I can say, when I stayed at AFIA, um, I really appreciated that. <laughs> Knowing that I was at a place um, where people had been through similar things was, made me feel a lot more comfortable um, at, at AFIA. These, these places are voluntary uh, and they're unlocked without clinical staff and uh, you can administer your own, take your own medications if, if that's something that you choose to do. Um, so at, the, at that time, I did take my own medications out of FIA. Um, currently I don't take medications, but at that time I did. Um, it's, an, it's often an alternative to psychiatric hospitalization. In my case, uh, I had just actually come from an inpatient unit to AFIA and I can say the experience was um, for me like night and day. I, I really felt uh, a sense of relief, um, a sense of freedom. I had, I'd come from a place where I was locked up. I could not leave. Um, I even needed permission to use the bathroom or take a shower. Um, those types of things it was very regimented. Um, and personally, I did not feel that was helpful for me. So um, once I got to a fee, I was very much still not in a good place, but um, I was able to really move forward at the, at the peer respite, having peers uh, to talk to. Uh, remember we would um, 
we would watch movies together. Um, we would um, eat meals together, things like that. I could leave the peer respite and go for walks. Um, and I really feel like that experience was, uh, was huge for me to have that uh, option. And I will say that it would have been great to be, have been able to go to a peer respite initially, <laughs> uh, but because there are so few of them, I was actually on a waiting list and I could only get into the peer respite when there was room available. So I think it really speaks to um, how we need more. We, we need more peer respites. I would love to see peer respites in um, every county in the US. All right, so I'll go to the next slide. Um, so peer respites um, are one example of peer run alternatives um, that kind of embody peer support principles or basic peer support principles. And these are just some uh, of the, I think the important peer support principles that uh, peer support is voluntary, it's non-judgmental, it's respectful, reciprocal, or mutual, empathetic, and optimistic. And peer support is not a program model. It's not focused on diagnoses or deficits. And that definitely felt that way at AFIA. I just felt like I was myself um, and being uh, treated as a human being with other human beings there, which felt really good. It's not about helping in a top-down way. It's not about being a counselor. Um, so even the workers in a peer respite, it's not like, you know, just because you may be at a different place in your life and your healing journey, um, you're not better than uh, someone who comes in and, and is in a difficult place in their life. And I could definitely feel that, that, that sense of equality at AFIA is really beautiful. Um, pressure, it's not pressuring people to comply with treatment or pushing any one way of doing things. It's not about monitoring people's behavior. So back to, oh, oh, a little bit more on peer support. Trauma-informed peer support is um, a training that has been developed. Um, I'm actually a, a trainer in this trauma-informed peer support. Uh, it's something you can get training in yourself. Um, and so this particular training recognizes and assumes that people have had trauma in their lives and re recognizes the importance uh, in being trauma-informed, which includes uh, creating these comfortable, safe environments. So this is definitely applicable to peer respites where you see comfortable homes, um, and we'll get a few pictures inside a peer respite. So you'll get to see what they look like. Um, the environment is really important. Uh, and it's quite different from a hospital setting. Uh, and trauma-informed peer support asks what happened to you rather than what's wrong with you. So here, here is uh, inside uh, a few peer respites. Um, and you can see how it's comfortable, nicely decorated. Um, there are bedrooms, bedrooms, not beds. And I remember being very comfortable at, at AFIA with my own bedroom, my own bedroom. And you know, not having someone check on me every hour sh or shine a flashlight in the room to make sure that I was alive or whatever. Um, so that's a little bit of a feel for how they look. And we can get to um, some of the evidence. 
Is there evidence for peer respites? Yes. Um, there's emerging evidence for peer respites. And this is one study conducted by Bouchery. And I'm going to just kind of skip down to some of the results. Um, so this was a comparison study and it uh, found that there were 24% fewer hospitalizations for people who stayed in the peer respite. Uh, and this study found a cost savings on Medicaid expenditures. So savings of um, 2000, about $2,000 for those who stayed in the peer respite. And then there is another study here conducted by Croft and Isvin, 2015. This was a study with Second Story in Santa Cruz. Um, and again, a comparison study and found that the probability of using inpatient services was 70% lower for those who had stayed in the respite than those who hadn't. Um, and for myself, I'm pro uh, I can say I'm a part of that statistic. I haven't, I haven't used inpatient services since my, la my last stay at a peer respite. Um, and then we have a study by Greenfield et al, 2008. And this one compared peer respite with a locked um, facility, inpatient facility, and found greater improvements across time with a reduction in quote unquote psychosis, depression, anxiety, in the peer respite group and gains in social activity and participation for the peer respite group. Uh, also improvement only in the peer respite group for self-esteem, for, for higher self-esteem and the satisfaction is much higher in the peer respite group than the inpatient group. This particular study did not find a cost difference. Uh, between the two. So with my, with my own experience, I will, I can attest to all of these <laughs> as being true for me in, in my experience um, at a peer respite versus uh, inpatient facility. Okay, I want to spend a little time on the resources before handing this off to Sarah talk about alternatives to suicide. Um, so you can find some information um, on peer respites here at these sites. There's a resource on the trauma-informed peer support, specifically on engaging women in trauma-informed peer support, but I think it applies to everyone. Um, and then a, a resource on intentional peer support, which is often the core training that uh, is used in peer respites for, um, for the workers there. And another training that is used in, in some, some peer respites is emotional CPR. Um, that also happens to be our core training at the National Empowerment Center. And um, so you have the resource there and there's also some information about a, a research study which is included in the references that was recently published. So we're very excited about that to now have an evidence base uh, for, for emotional CPR. And if you have any questions about any of this, um, I know we have brief, brief presentations today uh, feel free to ask them in the chat or um, at the end. And I look forward to hearing what your questions are and having a, having a dialogue. So with that, there is a references page and I believe all of you are getting this um, PowerPoint. Uh, and there is also a way to contact us. So again, thank you, Cheryl 
and the MHTTC. And um, I'm not sure if you want to jump in now. I'll jump in right now. Thank you, Oryx. You can stop sharing your screen um, and we will just have to yeah go down. Beautiful. Hello, everyone. Um, so we thank you so much, Oryx. And I particularly liked hearing, um, you know, really your 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 own experience woven through that presentation. So next we have uh, Sarah Davidow, who will be presenting on alternatives to suicide. Sarah, you can go ahead and share your screen. And I do invite you to please go ahead and put your questions, comments in the chat box. Some people have already. Um, sometimes you get immediate responses. So. <laughs> so thank you, Cheryl and everyone in Oryx uh, for coming together for this today. And Victor, I saw your question about peer respite and risk of not having clinical people. And I'm looking forward to getting to that and the question answers very much. So. I'm going to be talking, though, right now about alternatives to suicide. And suicide is one of those topics that remains one that people feel pretty nervous about, right? So I have been in various trainings. Sometimes I've been in suicide prevention trainings with primarily clinicians who are saying, hey, I've been doing this work for a long time, but this is the area that I'm still really nervous about. I still don't feel like I really know what to do with this. And so... Whether or not you like the approach I'm about to talk about, I hope that you will at least keep talking about suicide and talking about life and death in general, honestly, because what we have found is that death is kind of a taboo topic, no matter what direction you're coming at it from. And so even things like going to death cafes, where they're not specifically talking about suicide, but are creating space to talk about life and death within many, many different contexts are really useful because until we get to the point where we are comfortable talking about death and the normal course of life, I don't know how we get comfortable talking about suicide. And that's pretty important. So one of the things I just want to start with, and I'm going to be barely scratching the surface of these myths, are right, some myths about suicide, because if we don't look at these myths and understand how our current systems are failing us, then it, you know, it just, how, how do we become motivated to really look for change? So the first one I'm just gonna speak about very briefly is the myth of suicide risk assessment. Now, what we have found in research is that those standard suicide risk assessments that intend to measure acute risk and try and evaluate whether or not someone is likely to try and kill themselves in the near future, they are failing us. The best ones, according to research, have an efficacy rate of about 52%. And if you think this is radical knowledge coming from peer-to-peer -peer world wildflower alliance, it is not. Google it. I will give you a link at the end of my presentation that will also give you access to some resources that will include articles on this point. But the reality is that these suicide risk assessments and what, I, what I'm talking about are the ones that say, are you suicidal? Do you have a plan? Those sorts of things they are about as effective as flipping a coin. And there are very high ranking researchers that are saying the same thing. So important to know that because that's one of the most common things people are trained to do in response to when someone talks about suicide, shut down the rest of the conversation and ask them if they have a plan, things like that. For most of us, why is that harmful? It's harmful because not only is it bad at predicting, but it's a flag to some of us that someone is trying to evaluate us about as to whether or not they should take away our freedom. So I am someone, there are many other people in this community who have lost our freedom, ended up in hospitals that were not especially helpful to us at the time because of risk assessments and things like that. So myth of liability. Many people are using these risk assessments, however, because they have been trained that they will be more liable if they do not use these risk assessments. And to, in some ways that's true and that's unfortunate, we need to push on that, but it's also important to know that it doesn't make a lot of sense to hold people liable if they don't use tools that are ineffective. When we do longer trainings, we spend some time talking about that and how we got to this point. But the other point is that actually, even though there's some truth in all that and we live in a country where anyone can sue anyone for anything, it's actually pretty rare that providers are successfully held liable for someone's death by suicide. So using that as a driving force for what we do and how we respond is still not necessary. In fact, Susan Steffen, who's a lawyer that comes from Massachusetts and has looked at suicide and cases across the country found that at least at the time she wrote her book, someone was about as likely to be held liable for someone else's suicide as a non-prescribing 
uh, provider as they were to be struck by lightning. Just, just a small point for you to consider. Now, myth of pathology. This is where we get into the, all the statistics that are out there and assertions that get made that if you are suicidal, well, you must be what gets called mentally ill, right? There just isn't a lot of basis for that. I know, you know, people say, well, everyone who, or 90%, I think is the current figure of people who kill themselves have a diagnosable mental illness. Well, well, cool, except that I just want to be really clear that it's easy to diagnose someone because that's extremely subjective. And I know that when I went to a therapist for the first time, when I was thinking about suicide, they basically told me, well, you are suicidal because you are quote unquote mentally ill. Well, how do you know I'm this thing called mental illness because you're suicidal? That's a very circular argument that isn't especially well-based in research or science. Myth of force is another one. So when we see that someone's suicidal, we have been trained to believe that the hospital is the best place for them. And there is now a growing body of research that says actually going to a psychiatric facility increases the risk of suicide. And in fact, more recent research, a meta-analysis, which is a research that looks at lots of other research studies, basically said that for people who entered because they were suicidal, their risk upon discharge goes up for potentially as long as two years. And people who went into the hospital for another reason, not just because they were suicidal or maybe not suicidal at all, their risk for suicide appears elevated for as long as a year after discharge. So important stuff. Now I put in here the myth of suicide prevention. This is something we talk about at some length when we do longer trainings. Basically what I am going to say is that the alternatives to suicide approach is not suicide prevention. Why? Because suicide prevention has become an industry in this country. We see things, uh, well, I have to be cautious because I know Sam so sponsoring this, but for example, there's zero suicide, things like that circling out there. The reality is a lot of those approaches, those suicide prevention approaches push us to do some really harmful things like put people in psychiatric facilities and just try and control them in the moments. When in reality, what we're actually better off doing is focusing on why, what is, some, was, what is going on in someone's life? How do we support them? How can we move to a different place? And how can we support them to find their own reason for wanting to live, not just how can we control them to stay alive? And I think suicide prevention misses the mark on that a lot of the time. So we say alternatives to suicide is not that, although we still hope that a side effect of this approach is that people are not choosing to kill themselves. I'm going to go through this slide very quickly. I just want you to be aware that the Alternatives to Suicide Approach was developed by Wildflower Alliance, formerly known as the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community. The first groups happened in 2008, but they now exist in a number of different places, both online and in person. We have done trainings for a number of different states, and there are groups in Connecticut, Maine, Wisconsin, and beyond. We also began training people to do these uh, groups in their own areas in 2012 and have now done trainings in many different countries and particularly Australia we've been working very closely with and in fact we also now have an approach or a training that is not just about running the groups but is also considered an alternative to assist or QPR or other similar broader suicide prevention trainings that are focused on anybody who wants to go through them and learn a different way of being with people and this year particularly is a really big growth year for us because we've now done the first train the trainer for alternatives to suicide in Australia. We're going to be doing the second in Colorado very soon. We've done the first alternatives to suicide trainings even just for group facilitators in Colorado and California over the last couple of months. So this is an exciting year for us. In doing these trainings, some of the paradoxes that we talk about, and these are really important, these paradoxes of suicide, they include things like Sometimes the option of suicide is what keeps people alive. I understand that sounds really strange, but it's also really true. I have heard from so many people at this point that the idea that they have an out is what lets them get up and leave their house on a given day. And the idea that someone might try and come along and take away this right is terrifying and sometimes increases their interest in, in just dying and giving up. It's really important. And I know there's a lot to unpack there. Also, the more someone has space to talk about suicide, the less likely they are want to, to want to die. They're generally not the people who are dying. We see this in our groups. We see this in our communities outside of the alternatives to suicide groups. If people are comfortable talking about suicide without jumping into these risk assessments and then starting to filter people off into other places because they've been told it's too big of a topic for them to discuss, 
when we make space for it, more people get to the point where they're able to move through. And one of the things that I have found most interesting, there hasn't been a ton of research for alternatives to suicide because honestly, having research done is both a tricky prospect and often a privilege. You have to have a lot of money uh, in a lot of instances to be able to do that. But there was some research done, particularly in Australia on the alternatives to suicide approach. And one of the things I really appreciate it connects to this, which is that alternatives to suicide isn't so much about getting rid of all suicidal feelings forever and ever. It is about changing one's relationship to suicidal feelings, how they think about them. Perhaps the suicidal thought becomes a sign that something else needs to be paid attention to, like maybe something in someone's life needs to die as opposed to your own body. It's really important. And it's actually a factor that I see in other movements that are really successful, like for example, the hearing voices movement. That's is not about getting rid of voices. It's about changing relationship to the voices so that you can have a relationship that works for you. Now this last one, is also important, particularly for people who are in supporter roles. In order to have more influence in someone's life, you often need to let go of the agenda you have. So what does that mean in this context? It means if you are so focused on getting people to just stop feeling suicidal and you push and you push and you try and tell them that that's the goal, you're gonna have less influence in many instances. I can't make any globalized statements that will be true in every single situation, but I can share a brief story that I share a lot in the alternatives to suicide trainings, which is there was somebody who called me, apparently, apparently the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health told them to call me. When I picked up my phone, he said, DMH told me to call you because you would have the answer. And I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> Look, I, I don't have all the answers. I don't know where this is going. But what he wanted me to hear was that he was going to die. I didn't need to ask the risk assessment questions because he he was going to tell me right up front he was going to kill himself he had a plan he told me the plan so on and so forth and you know what was i going to do with that basically what he wanted to know and i had to make a decision in that moment and i work in a place where i could make that decision and what i said was i will never be the person who will call anyone on you against your will i'm not going to call 911 i'm not going to call emergency services no matter what you say to me so let's talk about it we talked on the phone we talked in person we talked on facebook and this went on for quite a while, but he maintained throughout it that he was going to kill himself. And there was still a part of me that was looking for, searching for the thing I could say that would lead him to no longer want to kill himself. And sometimes he would pick up on that and he would get mad at me and he'd say, no, you don't get it. I am going to kill myself. You are not listening to me. And I had to take a break and talk to others and like say, how can I just let go of this? How can I let go of this idea that somehow I'm gonna come upon the right thing to say? And at some point in my conversations, it became clear that there was maybe a question I could ask that would both signal me letting go and give more space for him to talk about something else. What I asked was, is there anything you wanna do before you die? It's a totally different question. It was an acceptance that he was going to kill himself, but also a curiosity of what he wanted to do between now and then. And he said, there is something I wanna do. I wanna create a photography show of my art. I want to show you my photos. I want you to help me do this so that I can be remembered. He is someone who lost a lot of power and control through trauma in his life. And this was gonna how, how he was going to get some of that back and leave his mark on the world. And so we talked and he showed me a Dropbox of his photos and we talked some more. We talked about where he could take more photos. And this wasn't just a one day conversation. It extended over a period of a couple of weeks. And by the end of that couple of weeks, he didn't want to die anymore because he himself had reconnected with his own spark, his own interest in staying alive things move to a very different place for him pretty quickly. And I'm not saying, hey, everybody just ask this one question and that's a magic question and it will fix everything. What I'm saying is I needed to let go of the idea that I could control him with my own agenda in order to make space for something that was much more powerful and ultimately gave him space to make his own decision to want to live. So alternatives to suicide really operates on a handful of principles. One of them gets at what I was just talking about, which is the idea that we don't need to be responsible for people because that's what's driving a lot of suicide prevention, this idea that, oh my gosh, it's my job to keep you alive, at least for as long as I can see you. It's not especially helpful and it plays out in many different ways not just with suicide, but with many other experiences in our various systems. So instead of taking that I'm responsible, responsible for you perspective. We instead wanna say, 
I can be responsible to you. We can be actually responsible to each other, to be present, to sit in the darkness with each other, to be willing to talk about these things openly and honestly and make that space. We also prioritize consent and choice. That means that at least where the alternatives to suicide groups are concerned, it is written into our charter that we do not call the police on people, that we accept that there may be some losses. But I just wanna tell you a couple of things. One is that there are gonna be losses in this world no matter what we do, there are. And we have to take a step back and figure out, are we gonna experience more losses if we create a path where there's space to talk, a space to choose, a space for people to take power and control back? Because I will tell you right now, loss of power and control is a factor in trauma. It's also a factor in why many people wanna kill themselves. So we can create that path and then we can compare that path to what happens on the other path where we just focus on taking control, taking power, trying to force people, having our own agendas. And I feel confident, you'll have to do your own exploration, but I feel confident we lose more people down that path that attempts to control people and takes their power away. And so we have to make some choices about the risks we're willing to take in order to create that new path in my mind. Now, uh, there's there's so many other things to say here, but I'm trying to go quickly. So I'm gonna keep going here to the impact of injustice and acknowledge how important it is that that be acknowledged. We learned very on in this community that people come to some of these places through, as I said, trauma, but a lot of that trauma is rooted in injustice and systemic oppression. And so we make spaces within the alternatives to suicide approach to to recognize that, to validate that, to hear that, to bear witness to the pain that each of us have had. And that is so important. And embedded in that is space for graphic detail. I just wanna make that point. Even in the peer-to-peer -peer world, we're often told that we can't handle graphic detail. These blank, blanket rules get made. But where there is consent, there's also space for graphic detail. We are not so fragile to never be able to handle that. And in fact, it sends a really bad message to say, hey, what you live through is so terrible that no one can even stand to hear about it. So we create those spaces. And we also acknowledge the power of loss of power, which is a lot of what I've been talking about already. And we create space for healing and community. And what does community mean? It means a thousand different things for people, but ultimately we're creating these spaces, hopefully where people can feel like they, they can walk into these communities, walk into spaces, have people they can turn to, have people who are wanting to listen. Now this is the centerpiece of the approach we use. It's called VCVC, it stands for Validation, Curiosity, Vulnerability, and Community. I do not have time to go into it deeply, but I hope those of you who are listening will join us for a training where we can. I will just say briefly, validation is about saying, hey, I can see you, I see you, I hear you. Curiosity is about saying, and I want to know more, I wanna learn more, and I wanna explore this with you. Vulnerability is about, saying, and I want to let you see a piece of who I am too. And community is about broadening and deepening, deepening those connections that tether us to the world. Now, this is one of the last slides I'm going to offer you, and it's a lot. And I am going to give you that link that, so that you can see this and spend some time with it if you want to. But the main point of this, and the main point I want to kind of move towards leaving you with is that we spend a lot of time in our systems assessing people as to whether or not they are safe for, you know, safe with, around themselves, safe around others. But in fact, what we want to do, or what I want to do anyway, is flip that on its head and ask the people who are trying to give support if they are safe to do that. So what this infographic does is basically gives people a tool to say, am I ready to talk to someone about suicide? The, if your answers are falling on that red side, ah, you know, maybe not. If you can't think beyond calling 911. If you work in a job that doesn't allow you to think beyond that and you aren't really comfortable exploring any other harm reduction approaches within that, if you think that the only options are to do a safety plan and then call for help, then, then you're probably not the right person to be having these conversations. On the other hand, if you are over toward the blue and you recognize that these conversations are gonna be hard, but you're ready to sit through it. You have the time to do that. You have other ideas about other resources. And even in the absence of other resources, you're willing to sit in some real discomfort and own your own fear without putting that onto someone else, then for sure. I still don't know if, you know, are you suicidal is the most useful question. We often get much more out of more broad questions about what's going on in people's lives and then 
questions that are based on what they actually say. But basically this blue side says, all right, you can have some of this conversation. Now, I'd love to talk to anyone who's interested about this more, this approach more in the absence of being able to talk with you directly though. These are some of the resources that we can offer. There's some articles that are referred to or been focused on alternatives to suicide in Caroline. One of my coworkers and I have also written a couple of book chapters on alternatives to suicide. So we encourage you to check those out or to take one of our trainings. I'm gonna leave you with that for now. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a lot. It's made me hungry for <laughs> more training in alternatives to suicide. And both of what you said uh, makes so much sense when we think about people who may be experiencing despair, uh, disconnection. Um, we know that the two most strong predictive factors for uh, suicide is a, you know, a sense of hopelessness and this you know um kind of disconnection from self from community from the world and and peer support is one intervention that explicitly addresses hopelessness right um and it's uh, you guys went into great detail about how you know it's not about negating the negative reality that's where hope starts is acknowledging this negative reality. Oh, yes, there's injustice. Yes, you've experienced incredible, um, you know, assault and trauma or, you know, yes, things are really hard for you, right? That's where hope starts. We have to connect in the despair and you both point that out, but yet we are able to kind of shift in a more balance. And, and in one way, Sarah, that you, were able to pull out was, you know, by being more future oriented. What do you hope to accomplish? That was for that guy in that moment, that was, you know, that was a, um, an often if we shift to a future orientation. Or maybe it's just like, you know, for, for another person, the capacity to make choices, you know, go for a walk, don't take a shower, <laughs> you know, make a snack. Sometimes that kind of agency helps a person get back connected to himself. And, um, um, so I'm really excited. There, there are a couple questions and some are, you know, logistical. I know one came in early on that you both probably have. I know, Sarah, you touched on the myth of assessment, but let's talk about, you know, the critique of peer respites because of the lack of clinical staff. Um, and either one of you I know you have both experience with this issue <laughs> addressing it, so. Yeah, I think we probably both wanna comment on that one. <laughs> okay. But, um, do you wanna go first or, or second, do you care, Sarah? It was your section, so why don't you go first? Okay. So yeah, that's a question that we get a, we get a lot. Um, and um, the first thing I would say is, you know, if you look at the research results, the, 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 these are oftentimes people who are in extreme crisis who are going to peer respites, and they are they are having all in all a better experience based based on the research. <laughs> They're having better outcomes and a better experience in in the peer respites. Um, so we have we have that we have that evidence. Um, I will also say that uh, if you're working in mental health in any capacity, as a peer uh, professional, what have you, you're there's always the risk of being sued for something. Um, just because you work in a hospital doesn't mean you're not at risk at, of a lawsuit, and um, Peer respites have been around for decades now, and I, I can't think of a single lawsuit regarding a peer respite um, that's that's happened. And I, um, and I can think of lawsuits that have happened in with with regard to inpatient facilities. So um, I, I I just think that that argument is there's not much 
there's not much to it really. There's 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 not much risk of of um, based on what has happened um, of that happening. So, well, Warwick. That said, are there any kind of exclusionary criteria um, when somebody applies? Either one of you, when someone applies to a, a respite or hopes to get in. Um, I mean, some. I believe some peer respites will only hire peer specialists, but um, that's not what I would recommend even. I, I think that you could hire the most qualified people and that's based on your lived experience. And it's not necessarily about having a certain certification. I will say that once you get hired at a peer respite, you do need to have some training mm -hmm. um, and that I see that training as um, helping mitigate some of these concerns um, of, you know, like I said in my presentation, most peer respites use intentional peer support. Um, some use emotional CPR, some use other trainings, some use alternatives to suicide, some use hearing voices training. Um, so it's important, I think, that the staff have training of some mm -hmm. sort so that they're able to be feel more confident and prepared uh, no matter what situation arises um, but I also think it's a credit to the type of training that peer workers receive in peer respites that there aren't these intense issues that usually pop up that may happen in a more um, and it may not be popular or feel good to hear this if you work in one of those settings, but if you work in a more restrictive setting, that setting just lends to more issues happening. Okay. If people are not feeling safe and comfortable and have a pleasant environment around them and are being forced maybe to do things that they don't wanna do, then you end up with actually making situations worse. Right. Um, so with that, I'd, I'd like to hear what Sarah has to say. Yeah, so I, I mean, I guess I would challenge back that question and say how successful are licensed people as far as, you know, judging by the outcomes in the mental health system at, at doing anything in any environment. So we have the hospitals that are full of licensed people that were showing an increase in suicide. We're not seeing them very successful at, at managing or supporting people to manage hearing voices, all sorts of things. We're not seeing actually improved outcomes in the mental health system over the course of the last five plus decades. So I think it's a mistake to say that licensed professionals create better outcomes because that's actually not what the research is telling us in any environment at all. And in additionally, we've had one violent, we've been intra, uh, open, AFIA has been open since 2012. We've had one violent incident there that happened in 2015 and actually People ask that question, like, did that happen because there was no licensed clinicians? And what we pushed back on and said, actually, this was one of the few situations where the person was evaluated by a licensed clinician who then pushed them to come to our house. And what we actually think was we did a bad job of saying, hey, licensed clinician, please leave the room so we can ask this person what they really want, because that person did not want to be there. And it ended up causing a lot of problems and leading to violence. So I think we need to first examine the starting point that question is coming from. Do licensed mental health clinicians on the whole lead to improved outcomes? Not in my experience. Additionally, and I, I'm actually, you know, I think there are, that's not to say that licensed mental health clinicians, that none of them do a good job at all and they're all terrible. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying overall, the research is not saying, hey, this is the answer. Additionally, what I do see as well is that when you're trying to do something different, when you're trying to do an alternative approach and you bring in people who've gone through tons of training to do a clinical approach, they have a really hard time and they tend to think that they should be in charge of things, but they tend to think they know more than they know about what we are trying to do, even with the best of intentions. And so, for example, the peer respites that are under clinical organizations often struggle there are hybrid peer respites that are overseen by clinical people and they struggle to be able to keep the integrity of the peer respite environment. And a lot of that is because clinicians don't necessarily know quite how to unlearn some of the approaches that they've learned. So I would say that in our peer respite, 
where we require people to go through intentional peer support, alternatives to suicide, hearing voices, and an anti-oppression training, that people in that peer respite are way more comfortable talking about things like suicide and hearing voices than many clinicians are. And in fact, I can't remember if I mentioned this earlier or not, but I went to an assist suicide prevention training, I think I did, where all the clinicians who had been working a long time were super uncomfortable with talking about suicide. So I actually think that we're often better prepared to deal with some of these situations. We have not seen a struggle and the research has not suggested that there's a struggle for lack of clinicians being in those environments. Beautiful, very eloquent. And it really seems to me the beginning of, you know, qualifying for a pure respite is wanting to be there. And it sounds like more people want to go than are able to go because of lack of funding and other, you know, uh, beliefs about people uh, experiencing, you know, severe voices are having a hard time. Um, for sure. Yeah. The voluntary nature of it is huge. And I really hope that these values, these approaches influence and move into the clinical world, not the reverse. Yes, exactly. And are you seeing that with alternatives to suicide, Sarah? How, how like in terms of your training, are you uh, reaching out? Are you uh, reaching, not reaching out, but reaching providers as well? For sure, because it's not strictly a peer-to-peer -peer approach. The groups are peer-to-peer, -peer, absolutely, but the two-day training that we do is an alternative for clinicians and others. And we are seeing lots of clinicians start to participate and become invested and have to grapple with, how do I hold this somewhat different perspective in these environments that still want me to do assessment and all that? So part of mm -hmm. our second day of that training is to focus on how do you share power? How do you reduce harm in environments where you can't just necessarily live these approaches in their in their fullest because of the limitations of your environment, but we are seeing it. And we're seeing a lot of providers who are, who know that there's something missing in what they're doing or that sometimes they're causing harm and they're grieving that. And we actually uh, have seen a couple of, you know, people usually ask how many people have died who have used the alternatives to suicide approach by suicide. And I wanna to touch on that briefly just because we don't track people, so we can't give you a confident absolute number, but we are aware of in the, 12 or so years that this has been around of four people dying who came and participated with some regularity in this approach with us in the groups in particular in all the countries and all the states where this has existed and two of them were clinicians. And those two clinicians both talked about the pain of having to hide their real struggles and the fact that they're grappling with the harms that they've caused potentially in their work. And then they moved away from what they said was the only place where they could talk about that openly, which was these alternatives to suicide groups. And we did eventually hear that they died by suicide. So I just want to mention that. Yeah. The importance of connection and belonging and, you know, persists. I think it's a, it's a need throughout <laughs> our entire lives and particularly during dark days. Um, uh, I'd love to see more, you know, death coffee, coffee houses <laughs> open up or, um, you know, you know, places where people can can honestly talk about it. There were a couple of comments in the box from providers who say this was the first I've heard of this and it's great. I love it. So um, I think that's wonderful. Wonderful. Any sort of I'm going to turn to Oryx and, and Sarah kind of when you see kind of the crisis, crisis service systems writ large, you know, across our uh, multiple systems, you know, in, in healthcare and mental health and addiction services, even in uh, criminal justice, maybe. Uh, what are some kind of uh, visions you have for change? What would you like to see um, on the system level? Something implemented or um, any other interventions that you believe would be effective um, would really change the paradigm of, of support. So is that too? Go ahead, Sarah. I, well, I, I was going to say, I've been using a lot of space work, so I don't know if you want to go first. Oh, go. Well, oh, on mute. You can go first, Sarah, if you want. Doesn't matter to me. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go first. OK. <laughs> my grand vision. <laughs> um, well, uh, I'm, I'm all for a huge paradigm shift, you know, and we've been working for this for 
for a long time. Um, just the evidence is pretty, pretty overwhelming that we need to approach mental health in a different way than, than we've been approaching it the past 50 or so years, 50 plus years. And um, so, you know, I, I continue to do these presentations. Um, made, I know Sarah makes movies <laughs> too. <laughs> we make movies, uh, try to get as much exposure as possible. Uh, you know, they've done it, Sarah, your organization's done a great job of getting articles out in major publications. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue, continue to do that. Um, Cause my vision is that we, we have a lot of power as community members and it doesn't matter if you're someone labeled with a mental health diagnosis or someone labeled as a clinician and that you should know more than other people or if you're a neighbor or if you're a postal worker or if you're whatever that um, I envision a world where we're able to support, all support each other better. And I think we have an opportunity now in a way because um, everybody kind of realizes that mental health is, can happen, mental health issues can happen for anyone with COVID. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's a whole weird dynamic there too. <laughs> Where, where now it's like, okay, yeah, we understand that you're, that people are having issues because there's an epi, you know, there's this uh, pandemic going on. Um, so when is it okay to have an issue and when is it not okay to have an issue? <laughs> All that um, kind of thing. But at least this situation is kind of opening up that conversation to say, well, you know, everybody can have a mental health issue from time to time. It's not about sick people over here and well people over here. It's we're all human beings. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity here um, for us all to connect. And that's, that's kind of the approach um, that we're trying to use is, um, you know, with our core training, for example, emotional CPR is we feel like anybody can learn to help support someone else through crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's kind of my macro level. Like, and, and we're starting to see this. Like, we're getting into school districts. We're we're starting to work with police departments. We actually got a grant from the entire um, from the town of Hudson to educate everyone in. Uh, or, or different segments of the town um, in these approaches. So it's a real community-based approach. So I see real hope in that, but that's kind of a long-term vision. In the short term, I think uh, we, we need more support. We need more representation at all levels of the mental health system. Nothing about us without us. Um, we need more funding for for all of these initiatives um but we're making we're making baby steps and i look forward to the day when there's a huge paradigm shift and we just look at mental health issues differently thank you oryx sarah you have about a minute yeah. and a half <laughs> so i would say that we need to make yes i agree on a huge shift which may or may not require us to kind of tear things apart but that said i think that we need to have a much more justice oriented focus we need to look at basic needs that are not getting answered we need to really take on this trauma focus and that's not to say that trauma is the answer to everything i don't think that but it has some very important pieces in it which include not identifying specific people as the problem, but looking at the context of problems. And that aligns very nicely with, say, open dialogue, which is getting some of the best uh, outcomes in the world 
documented at least by research and they're in northern Laplands of Finland and they say that the problems exist in the space between people which is very different than saying hey you're the problem you might be the one who's most visibly struggling but that's very different than saying the problems exist in the spaces between people in the relationships in the context in the environment and that again would links back to oh my gosh if we could just meet people's basic needs if we could have an anti-oppression focus that spans all the different kinds of oppression that people are experiencing that loss of power and control is huge and if we could center that issue of loss of power and control, that would be, in all these conversations, that would make a huge difference. It would guide and change the focus and the way that we approach people. And I also like to bring up Jim Gottstein's transformation triangle whenever I'm talking about how do we make real change. Jim Gottstein's transformation triangle talks about, well, of course, it's a triangle, so there's three points. It talks about the need for litigation, change in legislation in order to have real change. It also talks about another point is the change in public opinion, which is what we're doing with films and media and so much, and then the need for more or alternatives. So those three prongs all together are what create the opportunity for real fundamental change. And each of them have to hold that justice focus, that basic needs focus, that trauma awareness, and that idea that the problems don't lie in my head somewhere, but they lie in the context of our lives. That is a beautiful note to end on. I'm going to thank everybody for being here this afternoon. I want to thank my speakers, Oryx and Sarah. Transformation Triangle, everyone, <laughs> and we'll talk uh, again soon. Take care. <laughs> Bye, everyone.